In this third installment in Power Line's exclusive conversation with Herbert Meyer, we look back on the end of the Cold War, and in particular, the role played by Herb's 1983 memo to the president, Why is the world so dangerous? It's here that Herb not only predicts that the United States is going to win the Cold War, but also the reasons why and the dangers that might be encountered along the way. You know, the Cold War is now receding rapidly in the rear view mirror of history. You know, students in college today, the Berlin Wall came down before they were born. Hard to believe. Uh, and what I tell students is... There's the Berlin Wall. There's a piece of it. There's a piece of it, yeah. What I tell students is, uh, if you want to understand the Cold War, you can do it, I think, in three documents. One is Paul Nitz's famous NSC 68 from 1950, laying out our grand strategy. I would say these kinds of documents are our leaders talking to themselves about how they perceive things and how they're going to go about it. The second one, I think, is uh, the NSDD, as it's called, 75. In the second year of the Reagan administration, it said, here's how we're going to press on them, and here's how it's going to be hard. And then the third one is your memo from the end of November 1983, the one called Why is the World so Dangerous? It's, I've got a copy of it handy, right? It's been declassified. It's, been declassified. it's still blacked out who got the thing, um, but that's typical. And uh, i just share one sentence for uh, 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 people joining us here. If present trends continue, we are going to win the Cold War. Uh, and there's a lot more to it than that, of course, but you laid out the reasons why. And so I, I wonder if, uh, I sort of revisit this, I wonder if you might start by reminding our viewers or telling people who are younger, what was the world like in November of 1983? Things were very tense, and then you know, walk through the memo, and we can say more about how it was received and so forth. Well, you know, back up a little bit. When we talk about politics, we usually mean Republicans against Democrats, liberals and conservatives. There's a deeper meaning to politics. Politics is the relationship between the individual and the state. Globally, it's the relationship among states. We human beings have been trying to get this right forever. We've tried everything. We've tried empires, we've tried right-wing dictatorships, left-wing dictatorships, all these sorts of things. The Cold War was a titanic struggle between two ways to organize ourselves. The communist system and the democracy free market system. That's what it was. And if you're part of the communist system, you cannot let anybody be free because they'll challenge you. So they had to come after us to impose what we used to call a Pax Sovietica on the world. The Cold War was our effort to stop that from happening. All we wanted was to be left alone. And that's what the Cold War was basically about. And the rules of the game were sort of simple. Uh, what belonged to the Soviets was theirs, and what belonged to us was up for grabs. <laughs> In other words, we were all playing defense. All of us in the West for 35 years, just hold them off. If when you left office, things were no worse than when you took office, well, you'd done a pretty good job. By the end of the 1970s, it wasn't going well. The Soviets were on the march. We were losing our will to fight. Everyone thought, gee, maybe it's, we should let's find some way to sort of surrender elegantly and all that. And what happened is a miracle. In 1979, 1980, the three most unlikely individuals stepped onto the world stage simultaneously. Polish Pope, John Paul, woman Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, and that actor from Hollywood. And the three of them together said, we don't want to keep not losing, we want to win. They threw the switch from playing defense to playing offense. And that was the great shift that changed the course of world history. So for the first time since the Cold War started, we were on offense, which meant we weren't content to just not lose. We wanted to win. And that was the change. And that's what made everything different. Well, now you're being too modest, Herb. I mean, I, no, it all makes perfect sense. Um, but you, know, you, you wrote in this, what, nine pages here, whatever it is, um, you know, a very cogent analysis. Pointing out what could still go wrong, the Soviet Union might lash out, it's not clear what their leaders, if their leaders perceive this, you said one of the key questions is, are they going to figure out the time's not on their side? I think arguably yeah. Gorbachev and some of the really interesting people around him like Yakov Lev and so forth did understand that. Uh, but uh, uh, but um, how was this received when it was circulated around? And the president read it, of course, and, and Bill Casey. And 
Well, you know, it gets very dangerous when a nuclear superpower is going down. Yeah. That's as dangerous as it gets. And the answer to your question is, when I wrote that, and again, it was highly classified, very few people saw it, but most of the people I used to call our dear friends the professional hawks didn't like it. The Cold War was their life. It's not a matter of liberal or conservative or anything like that. We all were on our side and all that. But this is the world they knew. Their careers were built on this. In fact, I met a woman at the Pentagon, and she was an arms controller. Remember we had arms controllers? We were having lunch. I said, how did you get into the arms control business? She said, oh, her father was an arms controller. It was like the electrician's union. <laughs> so along comes this memo, and I said, we're about to win the Cold War. Well, you're challenging everyone's career, not just the shape of the whole world. And there was a general feeling that it's too dangerous to poke sticks at a wounded bear. So if the Soviet Union is in trouble, careful, it's getting very dangerous. And there was another memo called, Why is the World So Dangerous? And the reason it was dangerous is the Soviet leaders knew they were in trouble. They're not stupid. The, the general feeling is time's on their side, history's on their side. That's what Brezhnev had said back in the 60s or 70s. Well, the smarter ones in the Kremlin knew time was not on their side. They understood that American productivity was beginning to just go off the charts. We were in the middle of a manufacturing revolution. We were developing words like software and programming no one had ever heard before. And, they, and then you had Reagan who was coming after them. Uh, everyone cracked jokes about we invaded Grenada, which is an island smaller than the island I live on, the world's largest producer of nutmeg, by the way. <laughs> But it wasn't Grenada. It was for the first time we took one of their pieces off the board. We started playing offense. And what they said in Moscow is, if they take Grenada off the board, then what? Maybe Cuba or um, maybe Poland. And they hit the panic button. So it was very, very dangerous. But the point is this. The Soviet leadership, the intelligent ones, knew the truth. Time was not on their side. And along come Reagan, Thatcher, and the Pope we're going to push them with everything we've got. That's what made it so dangerous. These guys could try something really nasty. And you did have the shoot down of KAL-7, the invasion of Afghanistan, and on and on and on. It was very, very dangerous when you go after a nuclear superpower. It took a lot of skillful management, and President Thatcher, they had that. Let, let me tell you one story about this. We were developing words like software programming. We're just beginning to get personal computers. So we found out one day that in Soviet offices, after everybody went home at 5 o'clock, a KGB officer would go through the office and remove the typewriter ribbon from every typewriter, then go back at 6 o'clock the next morning and put them. We're thinking, what on earth are they doing? Is that means a shortage of typewriter ribbon? Well, some people would go back to their office in the evening, sit at the typewriter, and type out copies of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's novels and other what they call Samis dot underground work. That's how they made copies. So just think about this. We're learning words like software and programming. They're confiscating typewriter ribbons. We win. And you couldn't own a copy machine, you couldn't own a typewriter. Right. Citizen. It was things like that. And by the way, President Reagan gobbled up things like that because it was real. You could feel it. And once you understood that, we could win this thing. And we did.